Hi and welcome everyone. It's Lavender Sky Panther. Today is Wednesday, May 10th, 2023. And we're going to do something, change it up a little bit and do a little bonus card reading thrown into the week here. I want to give a thanks to, a big shout out to Jackie out there, a very kind viewer, for giving a few suggestions of what I might do this time for a topic or which card decks to use. And so some of the topics, I there was a list, um, a nice list of them. And just what really caught my attention for right now, because this is just kind of a sponta uh, spontaneous reading. I usually don't have this time of the day and this time of the week to do it. So this is great. Um, but anyway, in looking at the list, what really just kind of popped out to me were the words gardens and ETs. And I thought, well, what better way to do this little reading than to change it up? And I'm going to read some things from um, a book first before we get to a couple of the cards. And many of you may know it. Some of you may be completely unaware. But this is called The Custodians by Dolores Cannon. It was copyrighted in 1999. She passed in 2014. But the body of her work is pretty amazing. And if you go look at her YouTube, just YouTube videos with her doing interviews and talks and workshops, you, um, there's a lot of knowledge there, but I highly recommend you pick up any of the books because once you start reading, you get so much detail and, <clears throat> excuse me, in such a different depth and learning on all of this topic, you really just got to do it. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. So she has a long list of books. I recommend just looking through and see what jumps out to you. There is one called The Keepers of the Garden, I believe. Um, I recommend just my own personal journey it took me there. But again, your personal journey may take you somewhere else when you look at the reading list of hers. Um, I started with The Three Waves of Volunteers in the New Earth. And then I read this one. And if you're anybody that's been questioning where you're really from <laughs> in terms of on a bigger galactic picture, um, or you've had dreams starting to recur <clears throat> that involve ETs or galactics, and you're really kind of confused about why that's coming up, or you're suddenly having a recall that when you were little, you had dreams, very profound dreams with ETs, and you don't know why, do read those two books. And then it, I think the whole picture will suddenly become very clear for you, and the world will make a lot more sense. At least that's what it did for me. It opened my eyes. I think I started reading these about five or six years ago, and I'm so glad I did. Um, okay, so that being said, it's going to be this is going to be a little hybrid, kind of a pun intended. When you learn about ETs, you also learn about hybrids. There's a whole world out there. And if you already know what I'm talking about, you're probably smiling. But anyway, I'm also going to do not only reading from the book a little bit for each group, but I have three groups back today. So we have a group one over here. This is just a, a rock with a, it's a fake plant. I didn't, I didn't want to kill it and grab a real one off, off the tree outside, but this represents a ficus lorata. It's actually a beautiful plant. It's also called fiddle leaf. I've explained it in other shows, just gorgeous out in nature and of course everybody uses either the plastic silk versions or whatever in kind of like on home goods stores they people use this as a popular you know artificial plant or a real one to have in, indoors for nice decoration it's very healthy leaves but anyway that's group one so it's we're focusing on the actual plant and in keeping with one of the requests um that Jackie had about like gardens and before I forget because I wander all over the place and I just might I want to touch on that number one represents also look into vertical gardens just do an internet search on and on vertical gardens I know of some great links but I'm going to leave it up to you as far as your own taking ownership and investigating these things you're going to wander through on your own search and find what's meant for you that's why I don't want to spoon feed you any of them but it's just amazing what you can do with even just one tiny fragment of a wall and you can grow very lush gardens. So that's just my, my little thought of the day on that group one. Okay. And group two, you have this beach stone from Miami beach. It's storing beautiful energies of the sun, the wind, you know, the salt air, the sand, and so much more in there. So it's got beautiful energy to it. And then we have a candle and this candle is Cassia Noir. Beautiful candle. Anybody have any questions about it? You can email me. My contact for this channel is in the email address is in the description box below. Incredible soy candle, pure, clean, really great. Um, all right, so we pretty much have a theme, you know, of the the um, earth, you know, in the more vegeta vegetation point of view. We have earth energy with the rock, but we also have actually fire with the sun and water with the sea. So there's a lot into this one. And then we have obviously fire. So if, you, if that helps you make your decision, we have a few cards in the back. We're going with the, these lighter blue ones. That's coming from the Enchanted Art Oracle Cards by Mimi Pettibone. And then we have in the middle, it's the daily, give me a moment. 
What's this thing called? Hang on. It's the Daily Guidance from Your Angels. It's in Oracle Oracle Card Deck by Doreen Virtue. So if I can remember, I'll put it in the description box below. Otherwise, you know what they are now. All right. So go ahead and um, pick your selection based on the plant, the stone, or the candle. And I'm going to go ahead. What I'm doing is corresponding. I already kind of pre-selected the reads for today. So I already know what's one, two, and three. So we're going to get into it now. I'm going to straight up read a tiny bit to get your feet wet in this book. And you can also see if it's something you might want to look deeper into. I highly recommend it. If you found my channel, that's probably for you. Okay. So first off, I just want to start with a quote she's got in the beginning. You know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you know it. But if you don't, or even if you do, here's a good refresher. Two roads diverge in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled, and that has made all the difference. And that is attributed to Robert Frost, and you see the years there. And uh, so that's a good start. So, of course, if you're going to come down this road, I don't call it a rabbit hole. It's just kind of when you start to have an awakening or a spiritual, you know, light bulb goes off in your head, you discover you're going to be taking a path you never in a million years thought you would travel. And that's the one where we're at here on this channel, obviously. So here we go. I'm going to start with group one. And give me a moment. I am recording this, whole hand holding this. So I've got to kind of fumble around with one hand. So here we go. I'm just going to read the beginning here of chapter three. Things are not always what they appear to be. And this is, again, just kind of get your appetizer wet. Um, wet your appetite, sorry, uh, that came out wrong, to look into all of this further if you if something triggers in you to do it, if you're not familiar with this already, or you may want to reread this if you've already read it before. I think I'm going to do that myself. Okay, so here on this one, I'm going to focus on something else so I can read this better instead of trying to hold it, and it goes in and out of focus. So here, I'm just going to try to keep on the scene. I hope I don't get you motion sick. Bear with me. All right, so things are not always what they appear to be. Whitley Stryber was the first author to use the term screen memories and quotes in connection with UFOs and aliens. This is a memory of an event or thing that is not accurate. Something has been superimposed over what is actually occurring and the mind interprets it differently. Often it is interpreted in a safer, gentler way so the person will not be frightened or traumatized. When I heard of this, I suspected it was part of the subconscious mind's defense system, its method of protecting the psyche from anything it considers harmful to remember or to see in its actuality. Often these screen memories involve animals. I have had several cases where this appears to have occurred where an overlay in quotes, as I call it, has been placed over the actual scene. For some reason, owls feature prominently in this phenomenon. In Keepers of the Garden, uh, that's one of her earlier books, Phil was startled on a road late at night when an owl swooped over the highway and then over his car. Under hypnosis, we discovered it was not an owl at all, but an alien craft and small beings on the highway that forced him to stop. His subconscious had disguised the scene in a softer way, so he would not remember what had actually occurred. And actually, I have read this whole book, so I want, to, want you to keep in mind that the aliens that Phil encountered um, as she was doing quantum healing hypnosis technique, Q, Q, QHHT, uh, just putting somebody in a deep, deep state of somnambulistic trance. Um, some of the memories and, and things that seem to be like dream time, you know, often present in her sessions, in Dolores Cannon's sessions, as things that actually occurred. So in this case of Phil, there was this scene that actually occurred, but the aliens or ETs, or if you want to call them extraterrestrials, they're also interterrestrials and inner earth, that's a whole other discussion. Um, but they were, you know, kind ones. But what they do is present themselves as something else for the people who would not be able to handle seeing a side of what they actually look like. So what they do is create this kind of screen memory. So it's softer. And like she said, so nobody gets traumatized. Okay. So that's the message in there for number uh, group one reading that things are not always what they appear to be. And in there also is a message to not be afraid of what you see, no matter what it is and not to jump to conclusions. Don't judge the book by its cover because what you see, just because you don't understand it, doesn't mean, and that means me too, doesn't mean we should instantly hit the fear button 
And if you're ever presented with craft up above, you see in my Sky Shows a cover, cloak and craft, yes, they're there. Some are military, absolutely. Some are ETs, absolutely. Some are collaboration. Some are probably things we don't even understand, our beings. You know, there's there's a whole nother level to all of this. There's never it's an A or B. It's all of the above and be far beyond is what I like to say. So those are just a few running messages today for group one. Now let's go on a different note altogether to a more romantic note from these enchanted art oracle cards uh because that was another thing not um as a request not only the gardens and ets but there's also romance and on and on i do have a lot to say about twin flames i'm not going to do it right now but i have a probably different take than most um but i think a more enriching one and to give you some more layers to work with on what that actually means but we'll do that another time but here we go so from this deck you got um a gorgeous card really exquisite looking card and the message there is make some time for friends. Now, I want to say this. At this really kind of crazy time with awakening going on, shedding all the deception in the world, a few of us, the light bulbs going on, we're awakening spiritually in a staggered formation or pattern. You know, some are awakening more than others. Some have decades ago. Some are just starting. Mine started in 2010. Um, and then given the recent last three years that was really set to divide and harm humans with the injections, a lot of us, if you found this channel, have been losing a lot of, not losing friends. I don't want to say losing friends. It's never a loss. If something's meant to go in your life, it's meant to go. It's not a loss. Even if nothing comes in, quote unquote, to replace it, it's just a timing thing. And that relationship or whatever maxed out on how it would best serve you. Okay. That's how I see it. And there's a season, right? An age and a reason and a season for everything. Some things come, some things go, like the cycle of life with the seasons. We have a winter, which everything gets shed, you know, and, and autumn and the leaves go away and new ones come in. But again, even if new ones don't come in, it's okay. We come equipped, <clears throat> excuse me, in and of ourselves to communicate with anything. That's my point. <clears throat> excuse me. Some of us are making new friends and a new tribe and a new family through all of this of the past. And so it's, I don't want to say a good thing what's been happening the last three years, but it's just a changing thing. And that's okay. Change is usually a good thing. Uh, it might not feel like it at the time if it doesn't feel pleasant, but it ultimately leads, leads to something good. Um, that I believe for sure. And we don't know the timing of when that good is, but, you know, that requires then the patience, another lesson. So make some time for friends, yes, if you can. But if they don't come back into your life right away, friends and family that might have um, distanced, uh, uh, I hate that word now, I don't want to say hate, but, you know, quote unquote distance literally in the past three years, don't worry about it. Don't sweat it. You know, if the new friends or family, people you come into come to know to be like a true soul family, um, if they don't come in right away, don't worry. It's a time to really examine the self in terms of who are you really? What are your real gifts? And you're going to be activated with gifts when you're asleep and when you don't even know it these days. And you're going to become acquainted with those. So it's just a time for a lot of things changing on the planet right now. And it's okay if you don't have those friends coming in. In the meantime, what do you have? You have nature always and there are birds and dogs and cats and water and things that you know swim any number of things that become our friends even telepathic communications with trees yes or with the water or with animals and that's all part of also just relearning our nature our natural state which is all of these gifts and abilities we simply have forgotten that we know how to use. And now's a great time to practice them when the quote unquote seeming friends, you know, are kind of not in your picture. All right. Um, all right. So it's kind of a wild <laughs> pun intended again, reading there for group one. And um, so now we're going to go to group two. Okay. Group two. Hello. We've got the um, slightly different card than the other two. Um, let's see. But first we're going to go to the book and read your little passage, and then we're going to get to the card, okay? So for you, we're going to come back to that custodian's book. I'm going to read to you from the chapter called, hang on one second, uh, fumbling with this a little bit. Give me a moment. As I said, I'm filming and holding this, you know, with one hand while I'm trying to do the book. Okay, so we're going to come back. Uh, if you didn't see it in the intro, you know, we're looking at the Custodians by Dolores Cannon from 1999. And I'm just going to read an excerpt just to whet your appetite to dive into more of her books because they're fantastic, completely different from the YouTube interview. So do check out some of her books, uh, Hidden Information in Dreams. Okay, so I'm going to focus on this little scene, hopefully not get you seasick. 
while I read from the book, because when I try to read through the viewfinder, it goes in and out of focus. It's very annoying. Okay, so I'm going to read a little excerpt here. Again, hidden information in dreams. In my book, Between Death and Life, we found that the soul or spirit actually never sleeps. Only the body gets tired and the soul would get very bored waiting around for the body to awaken. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> it's the candles tripping me up a bit, sorry. So while the body sleeps, our soul or spirit, the real part of us, is having many adventures. It may travel to the spirit realm to meet with the master teachers and guides, to obtain advice, or to learn more lessons. It may also travel to other parts of our world, or even venture outward to other worlds and dimensions. These travels are sometimes remembered in snatches, especially in the common dream of flying. That essential part of us always returns to the body when it is time to wake up, because it is connected by the silver cord, in quotes. This umbilical is not severed until the physical death of the body for, uh, I'm sorry, this umbilical is not severed until the physical death of the body frees the spirit. Okay, so that's just a little excerpt. It's, yes, talking about um, astral traveling, you know, if you're not, if you're new to that concept. Anyway, this is a really good book. <laughs> I just highly recommend it for this and many reasons. So that's the message in there um, that you, you travel. And it's also about getting to what is the real you. It's the soul. And the concept of flying. You know, a lot of people remember, you know, have dreams that wake up and they remember flying. Well, yeah, you could actually have been doing that in your soul or spirit state in, in the night when you thought you were simply dreaming. There's a lot more to talk about there, but I'm not going to elaborate on that right now. I'm going to go to the cards now for group two for your card, and let's see what you have. So you have innocence, and I'm just going to pan over the card. How beautiful. It's a beautiful moment. We've got the musical notes, the love hearts, the ring, the golden ring, and the little baby, sweet little baby. And I'm looking, you know, it looks like, you know, she's like the mother of all children, like coming in to give some extra love. Um, here we go. Innocence. Beloved one, everyone is guiltless in truth, as no one can alter God's handiwork of perfection. Give us your feelings of heaviness so we can lighten your load. Give us any guilt, anger, or blame that may shroud your loving outlook. Enjoy the peace within your heart once more. Absolutely. Give it all up. What I like to do is imagine, uh, close my eyes and in my mind's eye, I like to imagine like a white wicker basket at a doorstep. The door's closed. There's a little stone stoop. And the basket's there on the ground to the right-hand side. Am I imagining that's what it is? But you have beautiful creativity. Imagine your own scene or, or borrow mine if you like. But I close my eyes and that basket is there. And I just, you know, there's a phrase called Cast the Burden in a book called The Game of Life and How to Play It by Florence Scoville Shin from the 1920s. And that's a technique called Casting the Burden. You take any of your worries or even the whole person and put them in the basket if you're worried about a person, a child, a loved one, whoever, or yourself. Put it in the basket. Close your eyes. You know, imagine that going in the basket, imagining like an invisible hand just whisking that basket away. And you know, it's all in divine hands and God's care and let it go because that's where it is anyway. But sometimes we need that little extra technique to remind us of that. It's out of our hands, literally, but that's good because it's in a higher power's hands that they can't be any better. <laughs> so let it whisk away. OK, that's just coming to my mind. Um, trying to see if anything else ties in. And with the book, too, so with the message there, I guess, you know, it's also just we get caught up in the 3D and the little pity things and these moments that trouble us or worry us. It feels very real to us at the time. But if you zoomed out, like in the astral traveling we just talked about, in our dream state, when we're flying about or we remember dreams, even if they weren't real, but, you know, a lot of times they do really happen. <laughs> we just don't remember that part because your soul is absolutely having those experiences. But even if you don't think it is. You're having some wild, incredible dreams. You're flying. You're seeing different places. Like, you know, you're doing things you would never do in the 3D real life. Um, but even that, when you go in that departure, you know, that takes that childlike wonder, innocence. You, you don't have a choice over it. It's happening automatically when you're flying about and discovering things. But there is that memory of flying. I'm just drawn to our wings. And I am convinced that we absolutely, from all I've read in ancient texts and other things, that and just from inner knowing, we absolutely have the ability to fly, but we just forgot about it. And it doesn't mean we have to have physical wings either. 
Uh, think about what it means to be grounded, what we've been taught about gravity. I highly suspect what we've been taught about gravity is absolutely not true, but parts of it, in parts, maybe 10%. Um, I, have, I have sources to back it up, but again, it's not going to be this kind of show right now. However, just know that isn't it funny how, you know, it doesn't matter where in the world you're from, people do have some kind of memory of like flying in a dream. Okay, there's a lot more to it than we think. But it takes the eyes of innocence. It takes us not being um, so programmed and brainwashed to believe that these miraculous things that we could do, you know, can't possibly happen, right? So we got to get over the conditioning and the programming, which we are right now in this time of the Great Awakening. Okay, that's all I have for right now for group two. I am going to get to a bonus card at the very end if you want to stick around or just, you know, jump to it. And I invite you also, as always, uh, do feel free to look at just this pot, this grouping or, you know, group one, group three, however you like if you want all of them. Okay, all right. Best wishes to you guys. Till next time. Okay, group three. I'm just looking at the cards, but I'm starting with the book. <laughs> so if you missed the intro, your um, actual message is coming from a pre-selected ex excerpt by me connected in. Um, it's called The Custodians, Dolores Cannon, copyrighted in 1999. Excellent book. I highly recommend this one. And also The Three Waves of Volunteers and The New Earth. Okay, so your particular group, let me see what chapter we're going to. I'm just going to read a small excerpt to whet your appetite to go read more of her books. The reading of the books, it's just night and day from what they show you on YouTube with her workshops and other things. So do that for sure if you want to get to know who she is, what she's about. Um, but also be sure to maybe read a book and see if that really uh, opens your eyes to a lot of things like it did mine. Okay, let me find what I was going to do. Okay, this one um, here, it's coming from Chapter 7, The Aliens Speak. Okay, I am just going to read you a brief passage, but I'm going to focus on this little scene because my when I try to read it through the viewfinder and show you the text, um, it always goes in and out of focus. It's really annoying. So I'm just going to read it off to the side. I hope I don't make you seasick or <laughs> motion sick and try to hold the camera still as I read. Okay, so here we go. The aliens speak. When I first began to work with Suzanne in October 1986, she was bothered by several allergies and we were looking for some sort for the source of her problem in past lives. She went into deep trance immediately and was an excellent subject. The sessions were highly successful. We had explored several lives and the information proved helpful. Her problem with asthma was traced to another lifetime when she died as a child from pneumonia. In the present lifetime, anything that interfered with her breathing brought on the subconscious fear of death and triggered an asthma attack. I'm sorry, I'm wandering a bit here with the camera. Okay. When her next session brought forth space aliens, it was a surprise because we were definitely not looking for it. Suzanne had never experienced any sightings, dreams, or interest in UFOs, so this was the last thing she expected to find, expected to find in a session. It was the beginning of my having direct contact with the aliens and having them speak directly to me. It was a spontaneous occurrence that was to establish a continuing pattern that would produce startling results. Okay, that's where I'm going to finish right there. So, you know, a lot of us might say, oh, I don't know. I've never had any UFO sightings. I've never seen anything. I would just ask you one question. Oh, really? <laughs> Read this book and then re-examine a lot of your dreams. And it's not scary. It's fascinating. It's good to find out what's really going on. And uh, if you're ready, if not, you don't. But this might be your first little cracking op crack opening of a door to look into the possibilities, okay, of your own life and look back to when you were a child, especially around 7, 14, and 21, 28, what was going on in your life. Do you remember anything, anything unusual happening that you can't just quite connect the dots on? Well, this is a great book to help pull it all together. I recommend that you read first, though, The Three Waves of Volunteers in the New Earth, um, you know, before you go about this one, the custodians, you know, just kind of prime you and get you ready to really discover some amazing things. This really opened my eyes, changed my world in a great way uh, about five or six years ago when I first found this material. Okay, so that's what I'm going to say about that. Now we'll get to your card. And your card is coming from the Enchanted Oracle Cards by Mimi Pettibone. And here we go. We've had this recently or, or before when I first started reading from this deck. Gorgeous artwork in here. And we have, she's got her comb. And this is spend some time on self-care. Okay. Beautiful, beautiful card. So even though that's kind of self-explanatory, you know, what are you doing when you wake up in the morning? Are you rushing right away to go feed a dog or cat or do anything and everything for everybody else and not yourself? 
If you are, this is a little wake up call to start putting yourself first. So when you wake up, instead of rushing off in a million different directions for everyone else, go get that drink for yourself. Go get something nourishing, nourish the body. Go get, even if it's just a handful of blueberries or just something to nourish the body and take care of the body and honor the body. And then go about doing everything else. If you're already in a, in a place where you're the only one and you think that's what you're doing that already, are you? Do you get up? Have you been shallow breathing if you've been nervous about something where you're only breathing up in the upper chest? Or are you really inhaling through the nose deeply, filling up the oxygen and all the cells way down in the stomach and the abdomen, letting the whole body get that beautiful oxygen and then, you know, releasing it? So, you know, just be mindful. Or are you waking up and you realized your jaw's been clenched the whole night, worried about something subconsciously? Well, self-care would be when you go to bed, just remember to tell yourself, all is well, no clenching, we're good. And you keep training and retraining yourself and then you're going to wake up with not doing that. In the meantime, if you're doing that and you're not realizing it, and just this very specific example, go get a little um, dental guard that you can, like uh, from if you're in the Western world, you know, in the local drugstore, and you just kind of, um, you know, form it, melt it yourself. It's just a little wax piece like, you know, sport people do. They put a little mouth guard to protect their teeth and mouth and so you just you know form it for yourself and put it in at night you know stuff like that self-care can come in ways that we really don't think of and you know some very good detail all right guys um i think that's it for number three because i might have to end this session any minute and i don't want to be cut short um but we are going to do a bonus card and maybe a couple more so here is a bonus card i pulled from the uh spirit animals by um baron reed and Gro uh, the artist della grotalia okay Ooh, okay, that's interesting. 66. Okay, that's also a 12 or a 3. It's a divine number, actually. Don't be fooled by the 66666 stuff. Do go look at Joanne's Sacred Scribes, an Australian blog site. She breaks that down beautifully and tells you the positive aspects of 666666. So we've only been, you know, so, you know, programmed in our society in the Western world here. This is, I'm just coming from my point of view, coming from Miami, Florida. I've, you know, been raised here, uh, but I've lived different places around the U.S. and also around the world. So I'm just saying from the Western point of view, put that little hat on, that little lens. You know, we're so ingrained to the point where I once went to uh, get a coffee and it came up 666 here in Miami. And the woman just like her eyes went as big as saucers and she was like, she wouldn't ring up my order. And I'm like, look. I don't care. It's just that number. Don't look at it as the bad part, but she couldn't get past it. So do you know, she even changed the total to six, six, uh, five. So $6 and 65 cents. She just couldn't do it. We need to come over, get over it. And we need to command. I mean, um, sorry, not command. We need to commandeer. We need to get our number back and for all of us who are good and loving souls on this earth. Don't shut her away from it. It can be a very divine number. We need to reown it. Okay. Um, all right. Now the beginning past that we've got this gorgeous, um, white, which they say is really kind of a cream colored Raven. <clears throat> Excuse me. Has some currants there. Hold on. <clears throat> My apologies here. Uh, has some currants. Um, just really beautiful. Look at this. Um, and then it's just says the white raven spirit, trust in the magic. So I guess it is pretty magical if you see a raven like this, right? We're so used to seeing the other, you know, the black form. And actually this kind of goes along with group, no, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the reading from group one, kind of, you know, expect the unexpected type of thing. Oh, no, sorry. Things are not always as they seem. Uh, you might want to look into that group. But yeah, things aren't always as they seem. And when we see something different, you know, the obvious messages are don't judge a book by its cover, right? You go back into lore and they talk about if you look at the Greeks, they're considering the raven as like very bad luck. Well, well, you know why? Because they were fighting against the humans at a certain point or the giants and Gaia of Earth. And the uh, that spirit was supposedly helping out the humans or the giants. So yeah, in their book... That was really bad. But hey, if you're the human or the giant, you're like, they're great. They're saving us in this battle. So again, look before you leap. Don't judge, you know, anything, a book by its cover. And look at the source, you know, according to who is it good or bad luck and why? And what's the history of that? And why don't you just approach such an animal fresh with your eyes and feel into the heart space to know if it carries a good or, or bad, quote unquote, good, quote unquote, bad signature to it, Right. If it's friend or foe, you know, from the heart space and don't give everyone the bad rap. Don't let it be the one, you know, bad apple ruins the whole bunch. Right. 
there's, like I said, good and bad in every species, every race. So even the darkest of species considered by a populace or collective, um, there's always going to be one that's not that way. Always one that's swimming against the stream, right? Look in your own families. If you're awakening, you're probably the only one that's acting as a lighthouse or a beacon to the world or wishing everyone well, while the other ones are too, too entrenched in fear. So if you were judged just by your family, oh my gosh, would you want to be? I don't think so. <laughs> so the similar uh, principle applies, right? <laughs> so anyway, also what's coming to me is, you know, 66, I kept getting this repeatedly, like for, for a couple of years now, sporadically, I'm like, why, why? <laughs> I'm a Star Wars fan. So of course it, it's home in a, in a bad way for me because that was, um, okay, spoiler alert, you know, that's the order given to kill all of the Jedi. Um, and so I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, why am I getting this number? But like I said, there are positive aspects of this number. I never look at anything as a bad omen, only something to learn from and to remind me of something. If it crosses my path, it's a mirror reflecting for me to look at something, whether it's a person, a bird or whatever. Correct. All right. So that's all I want to say about this one. And you know what? Just for fun, since we're here and I think I do have a couple more minutes. Uh, I used bookmarks and I just very pulled without even looking these cards uh, to serve as bookmarks. Okay, this is from the Spirit Animal deck by Kim Krantz. And so let's just see what we have. And I think I'll just, for fun, we'll just lay them out as they come. They did correspond with each chapter that I read, but I don't remember anymore. You know what I think I do? You know what? No, I'm going to put them with the chapter. Let's do that. Hold on. I'm feeling like I should honor how they came out. Okay, so pile one, you had things are not as they seem. You got the dolphin. Um, pile two was the elk. Okay. And your message, oh my goodness, i got to go back to what that was. I'll think of it in a second. And then we had the lion, okay, with number three. And you know what, I might just blend the messages in, because now without looking at the book each time, I might not remember. And then I'm going to put this over the raven spirit, because we got the cosmic egg, and this came up recently as well. This, this serpent keeps coming up, but not in the way of anything negative. For me, it's about healing, about healing is what I'm getting from this one this time, okay? And something higher and divine. Again, not judging the book by its cover on this one. Yes, there are. We've heard of the awful stories of reptilians and this and that and Dracos and all of that. But in this case, there's a lot of beautiful creatures and I've looked them in the eye, like in the garden, a black snake. And it just got such a huge loving maternal vibe from it. And we all play a role. Without the snakes, we would have an overrun in the rodent populations. Uh, hawks and other things eat the snake. You know, it's all the circle of life. So again, time to shed, if you will, pun totally intended, shed the skin, shed the beliefs that we've been ingrained and programmed with, indoctrinated with, that, ooh, if it's snake, it's evil. No, not all are, okay? Let's get over it, all right? Even the most venomous ones, which of course I shy away from, we all do for good reason, but even the most venomous ones, I learned recently that, you know, some, uh, maybe it's all, I don't know, but the ones that have the venom capacity and the sacks in their face, wherever it is on the sides, they know to hold back and not give their whole dose when they're sensing it's not total danger threat. It's like, you know, marginal threat. They won't give the full dose. So even one notorious for killing 100 people like a cobra or something, if they hold back, they're not going to do that. So and then if they're really alarmed and in high alert, then, yeah, they might inject the full thing. And remember, yes, there's venom, but there's also antivenom or venom. And so even in the poison lies the cure sometimes, right? So anyway, that's just what I'm getting from there. Now I'm going to come back here to our little trio of dolphin, elk, and lion. And things aren't always as they appear. It's interesting. I do have a story I'm going to give you, a fascinating true story. Um, I had a friend who really loved a dog that passed. And uh, the, the dog was a beautiful, like a golden retriever, gorgeous. You know, they've got the most beautiful disposition. Again, for the most part, there's always maybe one that isn't like this, but loving. And they use them for therapy dogs here in the Western world a lot. Um, but anyway, uh, we needed to say goodbye, all of us, you know, especially her to her dog. And she was finally ready. She had the ashes. So we went out into the sea. And um, I had uh, somebody had a boat, not me, <laughs> but we all went out and we she had the the box um, of her her beloved there. And um, we went out and just, you know, found a, a place where we all just said, OK, let's let's stop here and do it. And as she released the ashes into the water, I'm not kidding you. And there are many witnesses within a few seconds later, 
vertically springing out from right where the, the trail of the ashes were being laid down came the, the, the most huge, enormous dolphin springing vertically out, just gorgeous, extremely close to us. And then it dove back down and we never saw it again. And that whole day we hadn't seen any. And after that point, that was just a lone dolphin. We went further, you know, along the ocean, we started seeing dolphins everywhere. So again, this is like, don't judge anything by this cover. Was that a dolphin? Heck no. That was the reincarnation of her dog in the suit of a dolphin. So yes, it was a dolphin, but I totally know the spirit of that, you know, that dog was that dolphin or that dolphin was sent to, you know, signal that the, the loved one was good, right? And kind of shown off a bit. So it was just beautiful. That's what I get from this card. Hopefully that story means something to you. All right. And then the elk. Um, I, you know, I can't remember what your message was from, from the second pile. What did we talk about? Second group in that reading passage. Sorry, guys. I, I can't get to it right now. My mind's a bit scrambled with what's coming on deck for me after this reading. You, I just invite you to go back and look at what the, the message was. Um, but I'll just look at the attributes of the elk. And given that we're talking about these, um, uh, I know we talked about screen memories in group one. <clears throat> I think it was, uh, shoot, not astral traveling. Anyway, just forgive me. I'm going to just go in general where this is taking me regarding to this topic. Um, when we look at the elk, I can't think of the elk now anymore without thinking of Bigfoot and Sasquatch and all of that. And I know it doesn't come from the reading that I just did, but this is where this card's leading me now. And I think I can't think of the passage theme for a reason that I just read for group two. Um, anyway, it's reminding me of the whole topic of Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yaoi, Sabe, stick people. People have, you know, a lot of names for them around the world, yetis. Um, point is that apparently in the U.S. or North America, they tend to favor elk as their food source. So uh, that's what I think of when I think of this. So when you're out in the woods in some remote areas, even maybe not so remote, and you hear what you think is an elk, uh, really listen to that call. If there's something funny about it, you might be dealing with a Bigfoot mimicking it. Um, I don't know much too much about the elk other than, you know, they kind of travel in their groups, gorgeous, exquisite animal. But maybe you're supposed to look into this a little bit more. Maybe you're also supposed to just look into the Bigfoot topic more. If so, there are tons of podcasts and other things I've referred to in the past. Definitely go check out um, just a radio podcast, Yowie Central with host Sarah Bignall. Um, I actually appear in a few episodes. If you want to know my story, take a look at episode 66. Like I was joking about one of the piles with the extra bonus card, um, 67 and 104. Okay. I, I cover a whole variety of topics with Sarah and really grateful for her interviewing. And um, also there is AYR, the Australian Yowie Research Group, and they have Yowie Hunters, uh, Yowie Witness Reports, sorry, on YouTube. Uh, they're yaoi hunters, but not in the way of hurting or harming or hunting a yaoi. They are just hunting as in, let's find them like an Easter egg hunt type of thing and learn more about them. Then we have um, the factsbyhowtohunt.com with Steve Isdall. He is a hunter, has a separate channel for all of that. Yeah, I can't go there with the hunting. However, I'm not judging it. I'm just saying I can't go there. But on this other channel, the facts by how to hunt. Uh, dot com. He covers, he just reads stories from hunters and others from around the world who are out there, especially hunting, uh, looking for elk perhaps, and having some Bigfoot encounters. So I highly recommend that if you're interested in that. Uh, there's also another one, uh, Sasquatch Ontario on YouTube. And Mike Patterson over there talks about a contact that he has with a family of them for over 10 years ago. And they're fascinating things about them you would never believe. And if for anyone new to that whole topic, they are people. They're Sasquatchy people. They are not an ape or animal. Now, there could be other, you know, types of things that are coming onto our planet now that we have not seen before. People are talking about dogman, which is kind of like a werewolf. There's all kinds of other creatures that people are starting to cite now. And I think it's a part of this great shift that we're having as a part of the Great Awakening. And that we are going to start to see a lot of things. Um, I hope you prophecy and other types of prophecy and ancient texts do foretell a time where we're going to start to see things that we have never seen before. Or things come back that we thought were just myths like unicorns and other things. So anyway, check into that world if you like. Those are a few places to start. Okay. Now we have lion. Lion, of course, it's kind of hard to separate this from, I haven't seen it actually, you know, the, the Disney version. version. Um, 
Uh, I can't even really pay attention to Disney anymore now that it's become kind of like a dark uh, enterprise, let's just say, or maybe it has always been and just really rearing its ugly head right now. But of course, you think of maybe the Lion King and, uh, you know, the song Circle of Life and all of that. Um, yeah, so we've got that whole aspect with this beautiful lion. This one's even more soulful and reflective. When I'm getting off of this card, it's really like you really see the humanity in that face. Like this is a human, you know, human being, you know, a soul that's wise and isn't just, this kind of goes back again to group one's message, you know, things aren't always appear as they seem. You know, this is like the face of a lion, right? The outer appearance. But I am so picking up on this is a soul like of a human being. And what is the soul of a human being? And what is the soul of an animal? Well, it's all the same. It's the God spark, the spark of life. That little spark that comes in as a baby that you see in the, the ultrasound. Or the, um, yeah, the ultrasound, that flash comes from somewhere. And that somewhere comes from the same somewhere uh, out into the, the cosmos and the galactic and, and straight from source. Uh, so that's all I'm picking up there. Sure, it's a representation of of courage, of strength, and courage is coming from the heart, the cour, right, the heart, and that leads me back to the God spark, right? It's all in the heart. So, okay, that's all I'm going to say for now. I could go on forever, uh, but anyway, I hope you enjoyed this reading, and um, as always, I wish all of you tremendous peace and love. Lemur Sky Panther. Bye. <laughs>